It may sound strange, but it is the most natural thing in the world for an Orthodox Jew, and especially an Orthodox Rabbi, to believe that Yeshua is the Mashiach of Israel, that he is the very embodiment of the Torah. To be an Orthodox Jew in this land, and especially in this desert where we are now for nearly 25 years, we're here because I'm here, because I know that I must be a voice that cries out in the wilderness to show to my people that Yeshua, the Mashiach who is about to return momentarily, is the Mashiach who suffered for us and with us for the last 2,000 years. Now, once a person, especially an Orthodox Jewish person who has a habit of keeping the mitzvot, the commandments, who is observant of the Torah, of the law, once he honestly begins a search for the identity of the Mashiach, he cannot find anyone else other than Yeshua as that Mashiach, and so was it with me, and so is it with me this day. I began my search now very close to 27 almost 30 years ago. And as a practicing Orthodox Jew, I realized that the Mashiach had to have made his appearance because of all that was written in all the prophetic statements of Atanach. That Mashiach had to have come, that he had to have come at a specific time, and that time was prior to the destruction of our second temple, nearly 2,000 years ago. Now, if that is the case, the question is, who is he? Because all of our prophets speak of him. But moreover, I realize that as an Orthodox Jew, this interpretation that our prophets speak of the Messiah who was to come and to suffer, and to be humiliated, and to bear our illnesses and our diseases and our sins. Before the destruction of the second temple, as is told to us by Daniel Hanavi, by Daniel the prophet, and by all the other prophets, Yeshayahu Hanavi, Isaiah, this one also had to be confirmed by our rabbis of the past, whom we refer to as our wise men of blessed memory, Chazal. Now, that began a search through the sayings of the wise men by myself to find in what places, if any, did these, many of them who were contemporary with Yeshua himself, what did they say? How did they react? What did they think of Yeshua? Did they in fact make commentary and did they put that commentary down forevermore into our present day orthodox prayer liturgy in our prayer books? And I was astounded. I was amazed to discover, yes, they had. The prayers which all orthodox observant Jews observing the Torah, who pray today, we pray on the highest occasions in the name and in the memory of Yeshua, the son of David, the Messiah. On every holiday, from Rosh Chodesh, from the first of every new moon, until the highest of holidays, Yom HaKippurim, we pray a particular prayer which is called Ya'alei v'yavo, v'yagia v'yirae v'yiratsei v'yishamah v'yizacher zichroneinu v'figdoneinu 
וזיכרון אבותינו וזיכרון מושיח בן דוד עבדיך. In the memory of our forefathers, in the memory of the Messiah, the son of David, in his memory, who is this one? In whose memory? The Messiah, the son of David, the servant of the Lord, who has come and will return, and in whose memory we pray, who is this person? I had to know, as an Orthodox Jew, I had to explore, I had to find out. I had to know who this son of David is, who we were calling upon on every occasion of God's given Torah festivals. And I was amazed then to discover that in the festival in Rosh Hashanah, the first of the year, what we call the festival of the blowing of trumpets, if we do nothing else on that day besides our prayers, the one thing that we are required to do on that day is to be present for the sounding of the shofar, to gather ourselves together as a mikra kodesh, as a holy gathering out, together in order to hear the sounding of the shofar, the ram's horn. And it is on that austere occasion, the sounding of the ram's horn, when I read in every orthodox prayer book, no matter how ancient, I read the prayers between the first set of the soundings of the shofar, called Tashrat, and the second set, called Tashat, where we pray a prayer in which we begin, Yi Ratzon, may it be your will, Lord our God, and we include in that prayer that our prayers should arise and be heard at the time of the sound of the blowing of the shofar by virtue of the name that was given to us by Elijah the prophet of blessed memory. That name being Yeshua, Yud Shin Vav Ayin Yeshua, Sar Hapanim, his title, the prince of the face of the Lord God, the minister of God's interior. So are we told. So do we pray. So are we instructed by our rabbis of ancient origin and those who are contemporary to Yeshua. Those prayers were not put in by people of the church. Those prayers were put in by our own rabbis of blessed memory in whose footsteps I choose to follow. In whose footsteps I want to walk until I meet King Messiah Yeshua when he returns quickly, speedily, in our days. This is the moment I live for, and that's why I'm in the middle of the desert. These many references, even and especially in our daily prayer book, lead to an inescapable conclusion that Mashiach, Mashiach, the Mashiach we have waited for, the Mashiach who is our very life and our breath, Mashiach, who is the breath of our nostrils, Erech He is the one that is going to come and he's going to open our graves according to the prophet Yechezkel. And we who have perished together with him six million times over and over again, we've perished with him and he has perished with us. Many people don't realize that Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, speaks about the many deaths of the Messiah. The many deaths. Bimotav, in his many deaths, not his singular death, but his multiple deaths. He died over and over again, and it's because of that that I see in him. I see in him, I feel in him, and I know in him that he is the Messiah, and that he's going to come quickly when we search when we search the scripture when we search the scripture when we search the peroshim the explanations of our holy rabbis we have an inescapable conclusion to come to that the Torah of God 
gives to us Mashiach, the Torah of God, hands to us our life. It is a tree of life to them that lay hold onto it. And all its paths are paths of peace because the Torah gives us, if we search the Torah carefully, and if we search what our rabbis have discovered because they have searched it carefully, we understand that we find in this Torah Yeshua and a person who has found the everlasting gem of the Mashiach, Yeshua, will never run from Torah. He will embrace the Torah and he'll embrace all its holidays, all its festivals, all its commandments, because he will now have the power and the reason and the desire to obey every word that came forth and comes forth out of the mouth of God, because he has found the priceless gem, the jewel that the Torah presents to us, eternal life in the Mashiach. What kind of a book can ever give us this priceless eternal life except the Torah? For this reason, Yeshua himself said, Search the Torah of Moses because they are they, those scriptures which speak of me. And I search the Torah daily because they are the scriptures which speak of Yeshua HaMashiach. And our rabbis have discovered this and they know it. And because of that, I had to surrender my life to the one who came, to the one who will come, and to the one who resides here now within me, giving me forgiveness, giving me joy and peace, giving me the desire to obey the word of God and the power to do it, the power to observe every word of the Torah, the power to observe every word, every commandment that came out of my Lord God's mouth, because I can never be righteous but I can have a desire to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my might. Because Yeshua, Mishichainu, our Messiah, is alive. He's real. He's going to return and open up our graves, and six million will come forth out of those graves together with his body. He lives. And we, Am Yisrael Chai, all of Israel live. And we live because of Him. We live in Him and through Him and by Him. And He's going to return any moment. And I'm here in this desert for 25 years nearly to, begin, to give to my people the comfort of that message. The message of our ancient rabbis. The message of those who have searched the scriptures and searched the ancient explanations of those scriptures by our ancient rabbis and who have come to the inescapable conclusion that Yeshua is the only name that our Father in Heaven has given to us whereby we can know Chayei Netzach, life eternal by the forgiveness of our sins Kihu Mechaper Al Kol Chatotenu because He has made atonement for all our sins. So are we told, not only in scripture, but by our rabbis who have told us, this is the moment that we wait for. Wait for the voice that comes out of the wilderness to tell you this, and then will be the time that we will speak it aloud. That will be the time that we will then embrace him. We will call him forth as we called forth Joseph from Egypt. We will cry out unto him from the wilderness, and we will go forth to the marriage ceremony and meet our bridegroom, Yeshua HaMashiach, who comes forth to comfort us and to reawaken us to life, life eternal in our land, here in this land of Israel. That's why I'm here. I am not here to be a preacher. I'm not here to be some kind of a roving idiot. I've been here for 25 years to cry out to the four winds and to let them know that my people are being comforted by the knowledge that Yeshua is our Messiah. The Torah proclaims it. Our ancient rabbis proclaim it and have proclaimed it. And those who are of knowledge today still proclaim it.
I am one who proclaims him. I am one who loves Yeshua HaMashiach dearly and I am not afraid to open my mouth and to proclaim his name because he is a Jewish Messiah who has made a covenant with our Jewish people and who has paid the full price of his life to prove that that covenant of the Torah exists forever. I love him, but he loved me before I loved him. The Lord God of Israel loved me so much and all Israel so much that he made with us an eternal covenant of life and sealed it with the blood of the Messiah. This I tell you because I've poured out my soul to all who will listen here in Israel and whoever else will listen to the words of a crazy rabbi in the middle of the desert who loves his Messiah unto death but more important unto life. לחיים, שיהיה חיים לכוחם, לישועתנו ולגורלתנו ולשמחתנו for your redemption and for your salvation and for your great joy. Amen. Jesaja 35 Aber die Wüste und Einöde wird lustig sein. Und das dürre Land wird fröhlich stehen und wird blühen wie die Lilien. Sie wird blühen und fröhlich stehen in aller Lust und Freude, denn die Herrlichkeit des Libanons ist ihr gegeben, der Schmuck Karmels und Saron. Sie sehen die Herrlichkeit des Herrn, den Schmuck unseres Gottes. Stärket die müden Hände und erquicket die strauchelnden Knie. Saget den verzagten Herzen, seid getrost, fürchtet euch nicht. Seht euer Gott, der kommt zu Rache. Gott, der da vergibt, kommt und wird euch helfen. Als dann werden der blinden Augen aufgetan werden und die tauben Ohren werden geöffnet werden. Als dann werden die Lahmen springen wie ein Hirsch. Und der stummen Zunge wird Lob sagen, denn es werden Wasser in der Wüste hin und wieder fließen und Ströme im dürren Lande. Und wo es zuvor trocken gewesen ist, sollen Teiche entstehen. Wo es dürr gewesen ist, sollen Brunnenquellen sein. Da zuvor die Schakala gelegen haben, soll Gras und Roh und Schilf stehen. Und es wird da selbst eine Bahn sein und ein Weg, welcher der Heilige Weg heißen wird, dass kein Unreiner darauf gehen darf. Und derselbe wird für sie sein, dass man darauf gehe, dass auch, auch die Toren nicht irren mögen. Es wird da kein Löwe sein und wird kein reißendes Tier darauf treten, noch da selbst gefunden werden, sondern man wird frei, sicher da selbst gehen. Die Erlösten des Herrn werden wiederkommen und in Zion kommen, wenn mit Jauchzen ewige Freude wird über ihrem Haupte sein. Freude und Wonne werden sie erreichen und Schmerz und Seufzen wird entfliehen. Nicht, auch gar nicht, deutet hin, dass da irgendwo könnte Wasser sein. Nicht anders als Einöde und Wüste rund um so weit das Auge schauen. Und doch haben wir da Wasser. Und ich frage der Simcha Perlmutter, warum haben wir da, wo es nie nach Wasser aussieht, Wasser? Why is the water that comes out of the desert, right here where I'm standing, from a depth of 1,700 meters deep, with no pump, no electric pump, no diesel pump, only by the power of Almighty God does the water come out of the ground, and now for more than 10 years, 
does that water come out? The story behind it is very interesting. In the nearly 25 years that I've been here in the desert, my prayer has been that the 35th chapter of Isaiah would come to pass and that water would leap out of the ground and that it would be a sign to me and to all Israel that the coming of Mashiach, of Messiah, is very, very near because so does it tell us in Isaiah and in many other places. But who am I? Who am I to bring forth water out of the ground? For years I would scratch the stones with my fingernails until I was bleeding. And no water came out. We hardly had enough to drink and most of the time we didn't have enough to drink. Barely, barely we could scratch by and have something to eat and something to drink. For ten of those years I worked for the water company. And I would go from place to place and I would help them to drill wells for all the settlements that were being built in the Arava, the desert. And every time we would strike water and bring the water to those settlements, it was a great joy to me. But it wasn't the water. It wasn't ha Mayim, the waters that were spoken about in Isaiah, the, the 35th chapter. Those were waters that would come out without a pump. Those that were waters that would come out endlessly from deep in the, in the bowels of the earth. After 10 years, I stopped working for the water company. And they came to me one day with a knock at the door. We here had no water. Why? Because we publicly proclaim and proclaimed our faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. And many of the governmental institutions would tell us, you can't have water. And so we had always less. I gave water by working for the water company to everyone in the Arava. But for us, we had no water. A very strange situation. But one day, after I had stopped working for the water company, there came a knock at the door. And that was from one of the one of my friends from the water company called Mekorot. And the man's name was, interesting, Moshe, Moses Rosenberg. And he was a good friend of mine and he said, I have an order to go into this area and to look for water. I'd like you to come with me, even though you're not working for Mekorot. And I said, why do you want me to come with you? Who am I? He said, Simcha, we all know that you have a special hot line to the Lord God and we would like you to use that hot line to find water for us. I said to him, Moshe, if I have such a good hot line to the Lord God, why is it that everybody has water but we don't? He said, well, maybe this time it will be different. Come with me and help me, please. I told him, Moshe, on one condition will I come with you. I'll take with me my Hebrew Bible and when I come, I'll open it to Isaiah, the 35th chapter. That the desert will rejoice and blossom forth and the, and the Arava will rejoice and water will leap forth. I said, only when the Lord God speaks to me will I tell you to drill here. But if the Lord God doesn't speak to me, I will tell you nothing. He says, on that condition, I accept. Come with me. So we came together. We went together to all the different places in the desert. One place, another place. We must have gone to at least seven or eight different places. And the whole time the Lord was silent. I didn't hear a word. And every time Moses, Moshe would look at me and he would say, Simcha nu. Well, and I would say, Moshe, I'm very sorry. I told you I would talk to you only if the Lord spoke. He didn't speak. Finally, we came to the place where we're standing today and where you're listening to the water today and where I'm looking at the water today. And the place, as you've seen 
in the film before was empty. There wasn't a single thing. There was blue sky, hot sun, rocks, sand, mountains, dry ground. Nothing that would indicate that there is even a drop of water here. And in my heart, I said to myself, here is no water whatsoever. And then I had no long, I had no sooner spoken the words, heard the words of my own heart, than the Lord spoke to me and said, tell Moshe, this is the place to drill. And I couldn't believe my ears, I couldn't believe my heart. And I looked up and I said, no, no, I won't tell him. This place is a place of death, not life. And the Lord God, who always has the last word, spoke again to me and he said, yes, but I am the Lord who brings forth life from the dead. I said, well, if that's the way it is, then I have to tell Moshe. And I said, Moshe, the Lord God spoke to me. This is the place. And he looked around and looked around and of course he did not see trees like these because they came only after the water came out. And he said to me, Simcha, are you sure that this is the place? And I looked at Moshe and I said, Moshe, absolutely not. I am not sure at all. But God is sure. He spoke to me. I told you that only if God spoke to me, I would say it. So Moshe said to me, Simcha, if you can be crazy, I can be twice as crazy. If God told you to drill here, I'll drill here. So sure enough, he made a place in the wilderness, he cleared it out, and he began to drill. And as he began to drill, what happened was what we call in Hebrew, a broch, a disaster. I'll show you what happened. The moment he began to drill, suddenly, Flintstone. The drill hit nothing but a solid layer of flintstone. Couldn't break it. Couldn't go down. They worked night and day and day and night around the clock. If you looked out from your window from miles around, you'd see lights here in the middle of the night. They were working. And every day they'd go down a little more, a little more, a little more. In the flintstone. In the flintstone. By the way, in the Psalms, you look it up, it says that for Jacob, the waters will come forth out of the flinty rock. I didn't realize it then, but now I do. He drilled and he drilled and he drilled and after three months, night and day, he went down to 500 meters. Still no water. And then finally he got the word from the water company and he came to me one day and he said, Simcha, I'm sorry to tell you, no water, it's a dry hole. We have to go home, no more funding, no more money, gone. I was broken hearted. Not for me, not for him, but for God, because I had falsely spoken in God's name, I thought. And I looked up to the Lord God before I spoke to Moses, and I said to the Lord God, look what I have done to you. I have spoken wrongly in your name. I have been hasty in speaking in your name. It's coming to me only to be ashamed of my face and punishment is coming to me. I will never speak like that in your name again. Look what I've done to you. And then the Lord again filled me with his word and spoke to me and said, Tell Moses two more days he is to drill. Again, being a nice Orthodox Jew, I said to the Lord God, No! I'm stubborn. I said, I won't tell him. I said, I won't tell him. He said, tell Moses to strike the rock a second time. Well, that was too much for me. When God put it in the language of the Torah, I had to tell Moses to strike the rock again. So I said, Moses, the Lord God told me that you should work two more days, please. For my sake, if not for his sake, give me two more days of work and work until Yom Hamishi, Thursday. This was Tuesday. He said, Simcha, you know what? Because we're old friends, I'll give you two more days. 
but don't have any hope whatsoever because it's dry. No water. I'll give you two days and then we'll go home and finish. I said, okay. Now, let me tell you about Thursday, the two days later. That day is the worst day in the Jewish calendar. If there's a bad day in the Jewish calendar, this is the worst. And that day is called Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av. What happened on that day? The first temple was destroyed on that day. The second temple was destroyed on that day. The Spanish Inquisition forced us to leave Spain and to wander throughout Europe on that day. The First World War broke out on that day. How did it all begin? The spies back who went into the land way back 3,500 years ago came back out of the land and said to Moses, Eretz Ochelet Yoshvea, it's a land that eats up its inhabitants. We will not go in. And from that day we cried all night long. And the Lord God said, if you cry over a good gift that I give you, the land of Israel, then I'm going to give you something to cry about on this day throughout your ages. And always on the ninth of Av, we have cried and cried and cried. But the, the Lord God left us with one more tradition. He said, in the end of days, on that day, I will give you a major sign that the Mashiach is coming. Ah, wonderful. But who can wait till the end of days? Well, that was the day, the ninth of Av. It's in August. In August, the, high, the, the highest temperatures, it's 52, 55 degrees Celsius burning, burning hot, and believe me, it's a day that you, you have to fast. We fast, we don't eat, we don't drink, we cover our, our heads with sackcloth and ashes, we cry, we ask God to forgive us our sins and to bring us back again the Holy Temple and the Holy Messiah. On that day, in the afternoon, Moshe again came and knocked on my door. By that time I was already weak from fasting and from hunger and from thirst. It was a hot day, it was terrible. He said, come quickly, we have a, we have a situation I can't control. I said to him, Moshe, 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 what's the problem? Two days ago you didn't have any water. Today you have less water. What's the problem? What do you want from me? He said, I can't tell you, you have to look at it. And Moshe is usually a very calm man, not like me. And he said, you have to come. And he pulled me by, by the arm, took me into his car, and we drove out four and a half, five kilometers to this place. And when we got a half a kilometer away, I saw something that my eyes saw, but my heart and my brain didn't want to believe. I saw a column of water that was this round coming up out of the ground and Hallelujah. into the sky. And I couldn't tell the difference from where the sky began and the water ended, the water began and the sky ended. I didn't know one from the other. It was an amazing sight. And I said to Moses, please tell me what's your problem? What happened here? He says, all right, I'll tell you from the beginning. We were drilling. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, still no water. And I told my people, my crew, I said to them, everyone, stop the engines, get ready to go home, we're all finished here. No sooner had the words left my mouth than the drill went down into the ground. And before I could say another word, it came back out again. And when it came back out, it came back out with all this water. And it blew out all my equipment from the hole. And my problem is I can't stop it. <laughs> I said to him, Moshe, you have discovered the waters of creation. You've discovered the waters of Miriam's well that disappeared in the wilderness of Tzin here. These are the waters God has been waiting for to show us that the Mashiach, Yeshua, is coming. He said, Simcha, I think you're crazy, but I think we're all going crazy too. We came to the water and there were 15 to 20 workmen, all dirty, down in their underwear. They had grease and oil and they were sweating. It was terrible, but they were all covered with water. And I looked at them and I said, Boah Hashem, praise the Lord. And they looked at me and they said, Boah Hashem. And we grabbed each other and we danced like maniacs. If you ever want to see 25 maniacs dancing around, Jewish maniacs, it's worse. Dancing around the water over and over again and saying, 
Mayim, Mayim li Yeshua. Water, water for Yeshua. That's what we saw here. That's what we did here. We cried and we praised the Lord. And we danced and we praised the Lord. And we shouted unto the Lord the, the words of salvation. And then people began to come here. The, the geologists, the hydrogeologists came. And what happened? As they came, as they came, they checked the water which had now gone down to 1,700 meters. And when they drilled all the way down to 1,700 meters, more water and more water, there's no end to the basin, to the bottom. And they found more and more water. And finally, what did they say? It is indeed, they said, Mebria, the waters of creation. Now, Hebrew is a funny language because the word Bria, which means creation, also means health, Briut, health. So it's the waters of life-giving health. And what happened? Isaiah 35 again says, The lame man will leap as a gazelle, the blind will see, the deaf shall hear, the weak heart will be strengthened, the shaky hands and the shaky knees will be strong again from the water that will leap out of the ground. And people began to come from all over Israel. The television and the radio and the newspaper reporters, of course. But then followed Am Yisrael, the general people of Israel. And they were healed of all their sicknesses, cancer, leukemia, all the terrible diseases that are known to mankind that have come through our terrible sins were being healed by this water. And it was, became known throughout Israel and then throughout the rest of the world. And people have come here since. And the waters have not stopped flowing for 10 years. And it's for that reason I've told this story. It's not a story that has no meaning. It's not a story that's just an empty story. It's a story that says, have faith. These are the waters that tell you that our Lord God will come and the ransomed of the Lord will return to Zion with songs and everlasting joy in their hearts. And we will see, we will see Ayin ba'ayin, eye to eye, the return of the Lord God in Yeshua HaMashiach. May God make you happy and rejoice in what you hear and in what you see. Amen. Amen.